Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this video, we'll be talking about probability. And just like other uh, videos in this module, we're kind of lumping the conceptual and practical piece into one video uh, just to keep all these different concepts organized. And so to explain probability, I'll, I'll also explain odds and differentiate the two because uh, these are things that we often, um, or, or at least I've heard them often used synonymously or, inter or interchangeably. Uh, interchangeably. Um, and really, they're not. These are mathematically different things. Um, so I'd like to explain odds while we're at it with probabilities. And so I'd like us to imagine that we're predicting a binary outcome. If you're not familiar with the term binary or dichotomous, you can think of it as um, a scenario in which there's only two possible outcomes. Like, for example, a coin flip. Right? We can flip heads, we can flip tails, and that's essentially it. And so let's use this as an example to learn about these two concepts. And uh, in this case, we'll use a notation of x and y. Um, in other statistical classes or other things you might encounter, um, we might think of binary outcomes in various ways, like success and failure, um, meaning an event happens or it does not happen. We could think the presence or absence of certain events or characteristics or whatever it may be. Um, in this case, if that feels like too much, let's just think x is heads and y is tails, right? So that's the notation we'll use. And um, yeah, and, and so I note that sometimes when you talk about odds and probabilities, people are using this to predict things, right? To talk about things that might happen in the future. Um, and so we'll just explain this with observed outcomes for the sake of simplicity rather than predicting things. Okay, so let's say we flip a coin 10 times, we call heads, right? So that's, that's our call. Um, first one is right, or we are right, it, it's heads. Second one is tails, and so on and so forth, right? And so if we count all that up, we'll see that there's four heads and six tails that we observe. And so using our notation then, x is 4 and y is 6. And so let's use that notation, this example, to explain odds and probability of flipping heads in our observed context here. And so let's start with odds. So odds, mathematically, is just a simple fraction of x to y. In this case, heads to tails, if we're thinking about the odds of heads. Odds of tails, then, is the inverse, right? Odds of tails would be tails divided by heads. Um, and so in this case, we had how many heads? Four. And how many tails? Six conveniently displayed in this figure here. And so the odds of heads then, <coughs> excuse me, um, was 0.66 or two out of three. Odds of tails then is essentially just the, the inverse. Um, so tails divided by heads is six divided by four is 1.5. Right, so very simple um, explanation of, or of, excuse me, <laughs> of odds. Okay. <clears throat> and I know y'all love uh, statistical fun facts, because who doesn't? Um, so a fun fact here is that the different odds are multiplicative inverses of one another. So in other words, the odds of heads is the same as 1 divided by the odds of tails, and vice versa. Um, you're welcome to pause and do this math if you'd like, uh, but just something I wanted to throw out there. And so now let's go back to probability. So probability is not the same thing as odds. Odds was a simple fraction of one outcome to the other. In probability, it is a fraction in which our numerator is the outcome of interest, in this case x or heads, divided by all the possible outcomes. So in this case, x plus y, head plus tails. All right, so probability of heads is heads divided by heads plus tails. So that key difference between odds and probabilities is small, when we're looking at the formulas, but it, but it is substantial in terms of how we interpret these things. And so just know that if you encounter these two things being used interchangeably, they're not actually the exact same thing uh, from a mathematical standpoint. And so um, in our example, again, if we make a figure here, the probability of heads is, there was four, probability, or excuse me, um, the, den or the numerator was heads, the denominator is heads plus tails, four plus six. Uh, so we get 4 over 10, and we get a final probability of 0 0.4, or 40%, right? And so you can see that that's a very different interpretation. Um, our odds 
the number we got was 0.66, probability the number was 0.4, right? And so different different examples or different uh, numbers to the same context, different ways of interpreting things. Okay, and so um, going back to probability in general, um, so this definition is basically just, uh, yeah, verbal explanation of the formula. Um, so frequency of times and outcomes occurs, the x divided by the total number of possible outcomes, in this case x plus y, um, symbolized in a different way, a uh, different way is p of p or just p, p of x. Usually, like, you'll encounter p values in psychology and social science in general, and especially in psychology, and p values are essentially a measure of probability. Um, so you'll see it written in different ways. Um, but regardless, we use probabilities to predict any random event. So any event where the observed outcomes can vary um, in, you guessed it, random ways. So for example, and this, <laughs> yeah, I caught this earlier. I apologize. Um, I'm using the word odds here in a way that I just told you not to. So that's a good example of the fact that we're all human. Um, so that should not say odds, it should say probability of rolling a six on a six-sided dice. And so I encourage you to pause the video here and do this math yourself and see what you get. Okay, and I'm going to assume either uh, you've paused it and have done the math, or you just don't care to pause it. Either way, let's proceed. So using our formula, uh, our numerator is not six although it feels like it should be because six just represents the number on the dice what we're really interested in is this side of the dice being on top when, when it's rolled and so that is one outcome divided by all six outcomes so one side of the dice divided by that one side plus the other five sides right and so then we get one divided by six or 0.167 or we could say 17% probability of rolling a six on a six-sided dice, um, or really 17% probability of rolling any one of those sides, um, whatever side you're interested in. And so these are necessary in random events. Um, I guess worth mentioning that unnecessary in, in a fixed event or any event where the observed outcome is or, or always will be the same. Um, so maybe morbid, but for example, what's the probability that you were born 100 percent um but you could say okay that's observed what about the fact that i'll die right future tense um i i'm sad to say that it is also 100 percent probability um someday you know there are billionaires that are sure fighting it or funding a bunch of startups to try to live forever i'm not super confident that they'll get very far with it um so i feel confident saying 100 percent probability um if that's a little too morbid um What's the probability that the Earth will orbit the sun? Yeah, it's it's going to continue doing that. And the naysayers and hole pokers would say that, well, you know, um, not in five or ten billion years or whatever when the sun expands and um, absorbs the Earth. Okay, fair enough. Um, or if you've seen the, the wonderful movie Armageddon, um, it's very entertaining, but just a, just a trash movie. Um, but in Armageddon, you know, Earth gets hit by an asteroid or an asteroid is coming towards Earth. So you might say, okay, there, an asteroid could come. It's going to throw us off orbit. These are fair points. But the fact is that the Earth will continue to orbit the sun without some sort of complication or intervention. And so when we think about probabilities, we're thinking about those random events, right? Those things that could occur that will affect what we, what we know will already continue occurring, right? Those fixed patterns that we, that we observe. And we can use probabilities to think about the uh, various events, the random events that could disrupt those patterns. All right, so yeah, something to mention. Okay, so in terms of calculating this, um, some other terms we'll, we'll use here. Uh, so the denominator here, x plus y, all the possible outcomes. Another term for that is the sample space, the total number of possible outcomes. And uh, the numerator here, uh, often notated as f of x, or the frequency of times an outcome of interest occurs, or just how often some outcome occurs. And so you'll see it written this way in your book and, yeah, and in various statistics courses and content. Um, p of x equals f of x divided by the sample space. Um, and whenever you see f of x, just 
generally that's either function of x or in this context frequency. And so to compute frequencies, or yeah, sorry, to compute probabilities then, right, we just need to do those two things. Find the sample space, find the f of x, and then carry on with our, with our math. Uh, before we get into that, how we interpret probabilities, what these numbers mean. Um, so when we do this math, our number will vary between 0 and 1. And so we can put that out as a, as a graph here. And so we can see from 0 to 1 and all, everything in between. And so, for example, uh, when we do the math, it will always kick out as, as a decimal like this, like 0 0.23. Um, sometimes it's helpful to interpret these as percents. Multiply 0.23 by 100%, and we get 23%. Um, so 52% would be 0 0.52. Um, sometimes we might think of these in fractions, like if we get a probability of 0 0.25. Um, we might think, okay, one, one out of four. Um, that, that's fair, but once again, be careful with how you're using this um, because it can get blurry if we're, um, if we're starting to, or we could get in trouble if we're starting to blur the lines between probabilities and odds. Um, so as long as our, our denominator, like we say one out of four, as long as our denominator, all the possible outcomes actually is four, then that is correct. That's a correct way to interpret it. Um, if we're yeah, I'll stop there to avoid confusing things more. But I guess point being, make sure that you're interpreting probability and not odds. Um, so the safest bet is usually to think of it just in the decimal or in uh, percent form, but certainly acceptable and appropriate to use it uh, to interpret it as fractions too. And so the closer to one, the closer to 100%, the more probable things are. And so zero then is completely improbable or no chance. Right, it's just not going to happen. Uh, like I am not going to get get back with my ex. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm my current partner is. I'm very happy. Don't worry. Um, uh, 0 0.5, 50, 50 chance, 50 percent. Um, 0.25, we could say one in four, one out of four, um, one over four. Uh, 0 0.75, 75 percent chance, three in four, uh, and then one is 100 percent chance, completely guaranteed or probable. Um, so yeah, it can never be negative, and we already went through these. Um, yeah, and so there you have it, right? Pretty simple, 0 to 1, not negative, um, straightforward. And so to give an example of where you've actually encountered these before and maybe didn't realize it at the time was when we talked about relative frequency, um, whenever that was, one or two modules ago. And so the formula for relative frequency is essentially the same as the formula for probability. Um, or maybe it's more accurate to say that the formula for relative frequency is one example of a formula that mirrors the former formula for probability. And so in relative frequency, we had a frequency and interval, uh, which we actually listed as f of x in our table, divided by the total frequency count, right, the total possible outcomes, or in other words, the sample space. Right, so here, for example, uh, 3 divided by 24 was 0.13, and that was something we interpreted as relative frequency, but really was a form of probability. And so um, just like we're talking about here, when we interpreted these as well, we converted frequency to percent by simply multiplying the relative frequency by 100%. Um, so 0.13, the same as 13%. All right, so something you've encountered already, even if you weren't necessarily thinking of it in those terms at the time. Um, and so moving forward, one thing we should discuss too when we talk about probability is the relationship between multiple outcomes. Um, so in other words, if uh, we're flipping two different coins at once or if we're flipping the same coin multiple times, right, how those probabilities interact with one another. Um, so some key terms we should define here. First, mutually exclusive outcomes are two outcomes that simply cannot occur together. And so this weird N kind of looking symbol here, it's like an N without the, the line. Um, this means and. So here the probability of A and B equals zero. But when that's true, our outcomes are mutually exclusive. So for example, we simply can't flip one coin one time and get heads and tails right, or, or any sort of combination of outcomes, right? We can only get heads or tails. 
All right, so here the probability of heads and tails is zero if we're just flipping one coin at one time, right? Because it's just impossible. And so um, a rule that is relevant here is the additive rule. And that's, I forgive my spelling error, the probability of any of these outcomes occurring. It's equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. Um, and so now this weird U looking symbol means or. Uh, so the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. So for example, um, if I'm flipping that one coin one time, the probability of heads or tails is 1, 100%. Right? Because the probability of heads is, is 0.5, probability of tails is 0.5. Therefore, the probability of either of those outcomes is 100% um, because there's no other possible outcomes. Right? So an example of mutually exclusive um, outcomes, but nonetheless, when we are using the additive rule, we recognize that um, yeah, we can sum those individual probabilities to get the probability for any outcome occurring. Um, independent outcomes are two different outcomes uh, in which the probability of one does not affect the probability of the second one. So, for example, if we're flipping one coin multiple times, um, each time we flip it, those are individual independent outcomes that do not affect one another. It might feel like it, but it's actually a slightly different interpretation. Like if I said, what's the probability that you'll flip that coin heads 100 times in a row, right? That probability is small, but that's because we're talking about the group of outcomes and not the individual outcomes, right? In this case, the individual outcomes are still independent. Um, yeah, if we flip a coin twice, we can flip heads on flip one and heads on flip two. Um, it's when we're talking about the group of outcomes occurring. That's when this, this other rule is relevant, the multiplicative rule. Um, forgive my spelling mistakes again. Here is the probability that both outcomes occurring, or however many outcomes of interest, in this case two, the probability that they both occur is equal to the product of their individual probabilities. So the probability of heads on flip one and heads on flip two is 0.5 times 0.5. Right, probability of heads or B. Yeah, so two heads in a row, 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. Yeah, so for another example, what's the probability of flipping heads five times in a row? 0.03, so 3% chance. And so, yeah, the probability of flipping heads 100 times in a row is very, 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 very small. All right, you could try the rest of your life and it might not happen. Um, so I just went, there are better ways to use your time. Um, another key term here, complementary outcomes. Um, this is when the sum of probabilities is equal to one and it's exhaustive of all possible outcomes. All right, so in other words, uh, P of A and P of B add up to one. Um, yeah, very similar to something we've already discussed previously. So flipping a coin one time, those two outcomes are exhaustive. Um, yeah, there are no other possible outcomes unless, I should say, unless you're a wizard. Um, or a witch, or whatever the gender-neutral term is for a wizard or a witch. Um, I won't even begin to try that one, because I'll just get in trouble. Um, yeah, unless you're a wizard and can land the coin on its side. Um, I've never seen it happen. <laughs> I think I saw it in a movie once, but that's it. Right, so in all other contexts, these outcomes are exhaustive. Um, and so you can, yeah, using basic algebra, subtract the probability of one outcome from one to equal the other probability. Uh, assuming we're working with two complementary outcomes. Um, one last term to describe here, conditional outcomes. Um, and this is a case in which the probability of one outcome is dependent on the other. Or in other words, the probability of one is changed by the other outcome occurring. So for example, if we're drawing cards from a deck, a deck has 52 cards. And let's say we wanted to see the probability of drawing two hearts from a deck. In that 52 card deck, 13 of the cards are hearts. So on the first draw, the probability of drawing hearts is very simple math, right? 13 over 52, x divided by x plus y, 13 divided by all the possible outcomes, 52, f of x divided by the sample space, however we want to think of it, right? That's the probability the first time around. But on the second draw, the sample space, 
and the possible outcomes has changed. Right now, the deck has 51 cards, and only 12 would be hearts, assuming that our first one was hearts. So now the probability is 12 divided by 51. And so, using the multiplicative rule, 13 over 52 times 12 over 51 equals 1 over 17, or in other words, a 6% chance of drawing two hearts from a deck. Right, and so just one example of um, how probabilities, especially when they're conditional, can change pretty rapidly um, as we add more and more conditional outcomes. Um, like that's, a, I guess, a challenge for yourself is think about what the probability is of drawing three hearts from a deck. Go ahead and do that math and see, see where you land. And so to, uh, to put this in notation form, um, this slash here means given. So in other words, probability of u given p, this is just notation people tend to use. Um, the u and p are kind of arbitrary. Um, but here, the probability of u given p is equal to the probability of p and u divided by the probability of p. And I'll be honest, these formulas with probability, like they start to make my head hurt. Um, but this is something you'll be asked to do in, in the materials. Um, and something that's, I think, just good to know in general to understand what these terms mean and, and how we talk about them. And so um, some examples to hopefully depict this. So say we're interested in the problem, or yeah, I guess let's ground ourselves first. So this is a table coming from um, the, the preview terror textbook in the course. Um, so here it's a cross tabs of a woman who gave birth and it's showing the type of hospital in which they gave birth, was it public or private, and their insurance status. So did they have insurance or were they uninsured? And so let's say we want to look at the probability of selecting, um, if we're selecting people at random here, what's the probability of selecting an uninsured mother who gave birth in a public hospital? We'll call uh, selecting an uninsured mother U and giving birth in a public hospital P. So let's let's calculate some things for our formula. First, the probability of P and U, uh, so the probability of both occurring, is 80 divided by 200. Why? Because P uh, gave birth in a public hospital, so it'll be this row, and U, probability of being uninsured, oh, my mouse disappeared, that's this, this cell right here, right? So that's 80 divided by all possible outcomes, 200, 0.4. Right, so that's just a simple example of this. Um, now let's let's mix it up a bit. Now what's the probability of selecting? Or yeah, I'm sorry, I think I explained that poorly. So in this first example, this is just a simple and, right? Probability of this and that. In this case, yeah, I'm sorry. That it's the end of the day when I'm recording this. You can tell my brain is fried, so I apologize. Um, so now we're talking about the probability of selecting an uninsured mother, given that she gave birth in a public hospital, right? These sim seem like arbitrary distinctions, but it is important, right? In this case, we're just saying what's the probability of both happening. In this case, we're saying what's the prob probability within this instance of this happening, right? Of people that gave birth in a public hospital, in a public hospital, what's the probability that they would select an uninsured mother within that group? All right. So using the, the the notation from the previous slide, probability of u given p. If we wanted to do simple math here, we could say it's eighty divided by one thirty. Right. So in other words, of the mothers who gave birth in a public hospital, the probability that they were uninsured is eighty divided by one thirty. So we can do it just by simply looking at the table. Uh, if we want to do the full formula here, uh, probability of P and U we already calculated. Probability of P, uh, what is P here? Probability of P, P is giving birth in a public hospital. Actually, yeah, that's easy. P is public. Um, yeah, so probability of giving birth in a public hospital. How many gave birth in a public hospital? 130. What was the total? Outcomes, 200, so we can calculate that and get 0.65. Now if we divide the two, we get 0.62. All right, so we arrive at the same number uh, in two different ways. And so this is useful when 
maybe if we don't have the table in front of us, we're working with different uh, different numbers or different contexts. And so um, this we're not going to worry about in this class, at least in its current form. But I did want to at least introduce you to this term or this concept, Bayes' theorem. Um, it's a modified formula for conditional probabilities. And um, the reason I mention it is because there's a field of statistics called Bayesian statistics, which um, is pretty complicated, or it can be complicated. Um, but it's a, a very different way of using statistics and making inferences about parameters in a population. Um, that's, yeah, I'd say is, well, I don't know if I'd say that. I was going to say it's gaining traction in social sciences, but um, maybe that's a that's a misjudgment on my part. Um, but it is something that many people in social science and specifically in psychology, many people have argued that we should be using more Bayesian statistics than we currently use. Um, so I at least wanted to introduce you to the fact that this exists because as you go further in your career in social science, this is something that you might come across um, within the context of statistics and conditional probabilities. Okay, and that was a long video, so you'll be relieved to know that it's over now. Uh, we'll see you next time.